good evening. Let's go ahead and get us a songbook and stand up. And let's get started on uh, 243. 243. I love to tell the story and uh, of Jesus and his love. I hope you do feel that way. You love to talk about Jesus and about what he's done for you and uh, tell the world about him. 243. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story to be my fame and glory to tell the old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story it did so much for me, and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, will be my fame and glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Sing hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song. Will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story. Will be my name in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and Let's go to 128. Well, I hope that's the case, and I hope that we are doing our part to tell the story. It's a wonderful story, amen? I think the Lord did it. it made a difference in our lives tonight. Appreciate you being in church. Brother Tony, uh, hopefully, has arrived in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He's preaching there tonight. For Brother Mike Norris at Franklin Road Baptist Church, we're having a tent meeting. And uh, so pray the Lord to just use him tonight to be a blessing. I know that uh, it's a new place for him, and I know he wants God to use him. So if you would, when we pray tonight, ask the Lord to touch our preacher. And ask the Lord to speak to you. Don't just uh, 
uh, check the box of doing Sunday night church, but ask the Lord to speak to you. Let's try and worship in tonight for who he is and for what he's done. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, sure do love you tonight, Lord. And I thank you for the story of the Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that it's not just something I heard about. It's something, Lord, that I knew personally. Lord, as an 11-year-old boy, made a difference in my life. And I praise you for saving me. And I pray, God, that you'd help us to do our part, uh, Lord, to tell the story of what you've done for us and how you've made a difference in our lives. Thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for uh, the good morning that you gave us on all the different parts of the property, Lord. The morning service and how you worked in our hearts through the message today. And uh, Lord, we pray that tonight you'd meet with us again. God, please forgive us uh, if there might be anything in our hearts that would grieve the Holy Spirit from work. And we don't want that, God. I pray that you'd help us to remove any sin tonight in our life that you might uh, flow freely in this place. Help Brother Tony as he's preaching there in Murfreesboro tonight that you'd fill him with your spirit. I pray you'd bless him and his family. I'm not sure that they may sing. I don't know. If they do, I pray you'll bless them. And I pray you'd supernaturally empower him to preach. Give him liberty, Lord, tonight. And uh, do great and mighty things that only you can get glory and credit for in that place. And help us in here tonight. We don't want to just go through the motions of church. We want to worship you, God. And I pray you'll bless in this next song and in the choir song, the special that's to come. And help us to glorify you in everything we do and say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 128 till the storm passes by and I know that down in Florida there's millions of people literally this evening going through quite some physical literal storms but there's probably people in here tonight going through some spiritual and family storms and different things like that so this is a great song 128 in the dark of the midnight have I
things coming on, uh, coming up this week. Uh, do remember we have got the McDowell Baptist camp meeting, and uh, because of the weather, tomorrow night and Tuesday night they will be holding it at Zion Hill Baptist Church, and then on Wednesday we will be having service down at the uh, uh, Tabernacle in Nebo. Uh, so Wednesday night service. Do we know what time? 7.30, 7.30, meet down there at, uh, at the Tabernacle and plan on uh, the teenagers singing. It will be youth night down there. Um, and then on the 16th, this coming Saturday, the youth choir trip going down to Winston-Salem, leaving at 2.30. Uh, so plan on going for that and singing and being a blessing down there at uh, Grapevine Baptist Church. And then the following weekend on the 23rd is the uh, teens going down to Carowinds as uh, well as the walkathon, Walk for Life. And if you got uh, any questions about that, you can talk with Miss Bambi. Um, all right, let's go ahead and have our ushers come forward, and uh, we will take up our regular Sunday night offering. Of course, do be praying about camp meeting in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to that, looking forward to the preachers and uh, some good meetings there. Brother Mike, would you pray for us? got the bucket so save a lot of change for next week amen sorry about that all right brother david has well his wife let's let me rephrase that has had a baby and so uh they're in the hospital so because that brother josh is going to lead the choir tonight so choir if you'll come y'all gonna sing some be a blessing so.
heart. Let's stand tonight. Turn around and shake hands with somebody. Let them know you're glad your name is there. Amen. that are singing, y'all can go ahead and make your way on up here. Appreciate these ladies getting ready for us tonight. They're going to try and sing be a blessing to you here. actually called True Beauty, and it was written um, Proverbs 31, 30. It's favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And um, it's really, really, really special song to me, because I feel like so many times we compare ourselves to others, and I feel like sometimes we feel like we have to be just a certain way, or we have to look a certain way, or be a certain thing for people to accept us, but the Lord looks on the inside, and so this is what this song's about. appreciate the Bible, don't you? Appreciate good scripture singing and appreciate those young ladies and their testimony for the Lord. And um, I thank the Lord that is the truth. Sometimes we get messed up about, uh, we let the world corrupt our mindset, amen? And so I uh, thank the Lord for the word of God. And if we can get our thoughts wrapped around what is important to God, then uh, that's where it needs to be. So I appreciate you being in church on Sunday. How many of you are glad you saved tonight? Yes. Amen. Me too. Praise the Lord. Thank God for the good day he's given us. I know some of you are tore all to pieces. Some 
some dumb person scheduled the Panthers to play at 4 o'clock, so all you that are fans of the Cats, uh, they're going to win. Don't worry, okay? Y'all be all right, man. I know some of you are watching right now anyway, so it ain't going to matter what I say. <laughs> if I'm, I'm fighting a losing battle, uh, my team was playing good till they, till they blew the whistle and kicked the ball off, and then it was all downhill from there, so... Oh boy! So I just I didn't even care. Didn't, I didn't even have a chance to get in the bad spirit because uh, when you, when your mentality is you know you're going to lose already, then you don't care. Uh, it's, it's you know you get learn to lower your expectations to uh, you know if we win one game out of seventeen, it's a blessing. So I've lowered my expectations this year. <laughs> I don't know where you're at, but uh, praise the Lord. Thank you again for being in church tonight, and I, I do want to be a blessing to you. And I know any time that. Uh, our preacher's out, that's a big deal. And anytime I can't push a mic down, that's also a big deal, Lord of God. See, I'll be taking steroids up there in the, in the media ministry. Hallelujah. So I don't have to work out before I try and do that again. Amen. If you got a Bible tonight, I want you to turn to two places. And really, uh, we're going to go, I'm going to refer back and forth to both of them. So if you want to mark one, that would be good. Uh, you can look in 2 Chronicles chapter 35. 2 Chronicles 35, and then also, if you can pick up in the other hand, 2 Kings chapter 23 tonight. 2 Chronicles chapter 35, and then 2 Kings chapter number 23. And I, I do not take this uh, opportunity lightly tonight, and I don't want to just uh, think, well, this is just, you know, another Sunday night service. I want to be a help to you. I, I'm uh, not typically very nervous, but for some reason have been this afternoon. I just, um, I want the Lord, I want to be obedient to the Lord. And sometimes if I'm not careful, I can be dictated by who I'm preaching to and where I'm at. And that can dictate uh, my mindset for the message. But tonight, I felt like in the middle of this week, in the morning, that God in my devotion spoke to me very specifically uh, from this thought. And I felt like it was for Sunday night. So I want to be a help to you. But listen, that requires something on your part. That requires you to listen. It requires you to ask the Lord God, what do you, you know, what is it you want to do in my heart tonight? And uh, now, it, it may not be much, but I, it's hard for me to believe that when you come to church, the Holy Spirit don't want to do something in your life, and there's not some area. Uh, of improvement that you might can make or maybe uh, some way that God might want to speak to you and bless you tonight. So I would ask you please uh, to you know, ask the Holy Spirit what is it you want me to hear, you want me to change tonight. And I believe that if we'll do that then God can help us. We'll begin reading tonight in 2 Chronicles chapter 35 and I will uh, read some verses here for you and we'll work our way backwards tonight uh, from the end to the beginning here in the story. It is a familiar story, and um, but there's one particular part of it I guess the Lord kind of spoke to me about that I'd never, I'd never considered. Second Chronicles 35, and look at verse number 20. The Bible says this, and this phrase, my goodness, it, it'll come back at the end of the message, but this phrase, after all this, Second Chronicles 35 verse 20, after all this, there's been a lot of stuff that happened up to this point, but after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not unto thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God. How about that? Uh, he's speaking on the behalf of God here. He said, Who is with me that he destroy thee not? Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and hearkened not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. And his servants therefore took him out of the chariot and, and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to the Jerusalem that he died, and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers, and all of Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. And Jeremiah, he's the weeping prophet, lamented for Josiah. And all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah and their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the lamentations. Take and just look with me quickly back in 2 Kings chapter 23. This story is referenced again. 2 Kings 23. And the Bible tells us in verse number 28 
It recalls the story again. It says, now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles and the kings of Judah? Verse 30, and his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him into Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher. Boy, this is the part that really spoke to me this week. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's stead. Brother Cole, if you don't care just to get these lights, I'll just have one slide in just a minute. But we'll put this up, guys. And so uh, tonight, the nation of Judah, if you know anything about the division of uh, the kingdom of Israel and Judah, you know this, Israel didn't have any good kings. They were all bad. I believe 19 and 19 on both sides. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it might have been Judah that had the queen. Uh, there was only one. But the interesting thing in the history of the nation of Judah, they were not without good kings. But two, if you were to ask somebody that knows their Bible, they would say probably the two greatest kings in all of the Old Testament in regards to Judah were the kings Hezekiah and the king Josiah. And as you begin to read about these guys, you find out that standing in the shadows of Hezekiah was probably one of the, one of the greatest writing prophets in all the Old Testament, and that's Isaiah. Isaiah was the prophet during the time of Hezekiah. And then, uh, not, without, uh, you know, what, what, not, not without any, uh, I guess, heralding himself, in uh, the shadow of Josiah, you find out there's another great prophet of contemporary of his day, and that's the weeping prophet Jeremiah. We just referenced him in the passage a moment ago. But you find out that God brought Josiah, listen to this, in his perfect timing to the throne in Judah. And he used him in an unbelievable way. If you read this story, you'll find out there's no king that was like unto Josiah in the Old Testament. But we'll soon see tonight that the throne in Judah went from what I'm going to call a stage of victory to a state of vacancy. And I want to preach tonight for just a few minutes on this thought on from victory to vacancy. From victory to Vacancy, And I want you to stay with me to the end of the message tonight as I try to show you uh, what the Holy Spirit has showed me in this story. But uh, tonight, let me just give you a couple things to think about as we consider this King Josiah in the Bible. Number one tonight, if you're writing these down, let's think about this. Let's think about the trend that was different. The trend that was different. If you have your Bible, look in 2 Chronicles 34 and verse number 1. 2 Chronicles 34. Stay with me tonight. Use your Bible if you would. 2 Chronicles 34 and verse 1. The trend that was different. The Bible says Josiah was 8 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem 1 and 30 years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of David his father and declined not neither to the right hand nor to the left. Now, I don't really know if you can grasp that, but eight years old is really young to have a crown put on your head and uh, be coronated as king of Judah. That's a pretty young age. I don't care who you are. By the way, it, how cool of a thing would that be? I mean, bragging rights would be yours forever. Yeah, all right, what do you do? Well, I'm king. Uh, you know, does anything else need to be said? I don't think so. But you see here tonight, I'm talking about there's a trend that was different. Josiah had a grandpa whose name was Manasseh. And Manasseh was a wicked man. As a matter of fact, he was the longest standing king in the nation of Judah, and Manasseh was wicked. I mean, everything he did brought about wickedness to the land of Judah. He sowed seeds in the good fields of Judah, and by the time his kingdom was over, they were poisoned with sin. He was a terrible king. He brought great reproach upon Judah. And by the way, tried to amend his ways in the end of his kingdom, but it was to no avail. And then Josiah had a daddy whose name was Ammon. And Ammon reigned in the land for only two years. And when Josiah was six to Josiah was eight years old, when he was eight years old, he heard that his father got murdered by a plot in the palace. And so up to this point, for 50-some years, his grandpa's a heathen. For two years, Josiah is watching nothing but a bunch of men who worship false pagan gods, and he has been reared and groomed uh, to follow right in the footsteps. Boy, if you were to ask an innocent bystander, what do you think Josiah's going to do? Kevin, they'd probably tell you this. He's going to be just like his daddy. He's going to be just like his grandpa is. I mean, boy, and walk in the ways of Baal and walk in the ways of their false gods. But I'm 
will tell you what happened. Most assume that, but Josiah did something different than what everybody else expected. Josiah, listen, broke the trend in his day. If you will, he went against the culture. He was a countercultural king, and he broke the mold that his family had set for him. His example for years was this. Boy, we serve Baal, and we worship false gods, but it just so happens when Josiah comes on the scene, things begin to change. Amen. He decided, I will not walk in the ways of my father. And thank God for somebody who has the courage in their life, regardless of the pattern they grew up in, that just decides one day, hey, regardless of what's took place in my life, I am going to serve the Lord. Amen. And that's exactly what Josiah did. Hey, he didn't allow the pattern and the popularity and the pollution of his day to dictate his life decisions. Josiah could look back at Manasseh. I mean, boy, for all those years, he was a long-standing king. And then Ammon, and boy, the pressure was put on him as a young boy. But the trend was different in his day. He broke the, tre the listen, the terrible trend of evil in Judah. You say, how did he do it? I believe he did it in two ways. I believe he broke that trend by his faith. He was groomed to follow the pagan gods, but he made a decision to choose Jehovah God. You know what Elijah told him one day on that mountain? He said, choose you this day. He said, if Baal be God, then serve him. But if the Lord be God, then serve him. And you know, there has to come a place in every Christian's life where you do that. You remember tonight when you did that in your life? Hey, you had a decision to follow the trend of your day. And some of you decided by the grace of God, he was going to go against the grain and do what was right and be different. And that's what Josiah did. His faith, let me say something to you tonight. It was personal. The Bible says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Nobody forced Josiah to do right. Nobody, put, listen, painted him in a corner and said, Joe, you're going to do well, what we ask you to do. It was a personal decision. His faith was. And you know, in every life tonight, hey, that's exactly what it's got to be for you. For, listen, for me and for these young men, I don't care if you're an elderly saint in this church tonight, there's got to be a time somewhere along the way that if you're going to make a difference, you've got to go against the trends of this world and you'll do that by your faith. And it was a personal faith. Let me say this. It was a passionate faith that he had. The Bible says in Chronicles that he declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. Any opportunity that was given him to do wrong, he said, no, thank you. This boy right here, Josiah, is living for God. He would have been the one with a sandwich sign on the courthouse out there preaching with his Bible. Amen. The fanatic that thought, man, what's wrong with that guy, Brother Justin? And looked at him and thought, boy, this guy's a little bit different. And he was not ashamed of who he was. Let me just say something tonight. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Amen. Amen. I was at Dollar General the other day and there's a guy sitting in a BMW and I thought, well, he don't want to track. Holy Ghost said, by the way, Dollar General with a BMW, amen. I mean, Dollar General is good for anybody, ain't it? Praise the Lord. It don't matter if you're rich or poor. Pull into the Dollar General. They'll help you. And uh, there's a little plug right there because we got like 300 of them in McDowell County. Amen. Three of my neighbors are Dollar General. So, but uh, you know, I sit there and I thought, ah. I thought, I'm just going to get the car. And the Holy Spirit said, are you serious right now? You get over and give him a track. I walked over and said, man, let me give you a track tell you about the Lord Jesus and what he can do for your life. You know what he did? He took it. And he might have read it. I don't know. But you know, sometimes we feel like that we need to be the inferior ones of society. Well, you know, boy, they, they walk around saying, keep your faith to yourself. No, you shouldn't keep it to yourself. Hey, you should hail it from the housetops about what Jesus has done in your life. And don't be ashamed of it. Come on now. We're living in a society today. We're scared to, death to let somebody know that we're a Christian. Wear a logo. Wear Jesus on your t-shirt if you wear one. Amen. And don't be ashamed of who you are. Let me say this tonight. He broke the trend by his faith. He broke the trend tonight, I believe, by his focus. Look at verse 3. The Bible says this. For in the eighth year of his reign, while, look at this now, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father, while he was yet a youth, the Bible says this, he decided right then and there, I will follow Jesus. Hey, tonight, if you're in the room, now, we got a lot of young people in our church. 
Let's just say this tonight. If you're 18 years or under, would you stand up for just a minute? I don't say if you wish you was that. If you are 18 years old or under, stand up. Can I say something to you tonight? Hey, there's been a lot invested to you into this church, man. You got, listen, you got youth leaders that love you, and you got a children's pastor that loves you, you got a preacher that loves you. Can I just I commend you for something tonight? Hey, make a decision while you're young, you're gonna serve, you're gonna serve God and do right. Hey, in 1904, there was one of the greatest revivals took place we read about. It was the Welsh Revival. You know what happened in that Welsh Revival? A young girl, Abigail by the name of Flory Evans, is having a prayer meeting and a testimony time. And the pastor, Joseph, said, hey, anybody got a testimony? And Flory Evans stood up right in all her peers, nervous and shaking. Here's what she said. She said, I love Jesus with all my heart. And when she gave that testimony, there's something that happened inside that service that began to break the hearts of the other young people sitting there. And God did a work to see over 100,000 people saved because there's a young girl that was not ashamed of her faith. Hey, tonight, while you're young, don't be ashamed. Hey, be the Christian God's called you to be tonight. You can be seated. Josiah, tonight, we see the trend that was different. Thank you for that, Josiah. Thank you for setting an example that we can do right. What a blessing that it is that you can look at him and think, it don't matter where you come from. Man, in the, this morning, the bus ministry, we had a good day. Picked up a, a lot of kids from a lot of different walks of life. I picked up one boy this morning, and Brother Roy, for years, him and Brother Ray, for years, brought uh, the Romero family to church. <laughs> You seen your buddy today, didn't you? I don't know if you did, Brother Roy. But uh, this one boy come, and well, for years they picked up this family. One of them just got out of jail yesterday, and he had his little boy there. And I said, man, how are you? Hadn't seen you in a long time. He said, he said man, you, you run the bus down here still? I said, sure do. I said, you want to come tomorrow? He said, man, I really want to, he said, I really want to be there and bring my little boy. I got introduced to him, and I thought, boy, you know, and that family in some ways is a real wreck. But I'm going to tell you what. If they, if they make a decision in their life that I'm going to ride the church bus and I'm going to just decide to give my heart to God, it don't matter what kind of household they live in. You know what God can do? God can take one of them just like he took Josiah and do something great with that life. That's the God we're serving today. That's why we jump on the buses in the morning and run them. That's why Brother Roy encourages that in the bus ministry because we know that it don't matter where you come from or who your parents are, you can do right. Amen. And you can make a difference for God. And Josiah did just that. What a blessing that is. The trend that was different. Consider secondly tonight, the truth that was discovered. Boy, look at 2 Chronicles 34, verse number 8. The Bible says now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, the Bible says that he, at the end of the verse, sent to repair the house of the Lord his God. When Josiah finally decided, I'm going to do right, he started looking around and he thought, man, we're a wreck. <laughs> we're a spiritual mess in this land. I mean, he looked at the remnants of what his grandpa and what his dad did, and he, he, start, he went to the temple and started looking around. The temple was a place of revered, it was a, the most revered structure there in Jerusalem, but it had become a museum, listen, of superstition and idol worship that temple had. And then Josiah would walk around, he just looked and thought, oh God, I know you're grieved by this. And he'd see things in that temple that you really couldn't even talk about, uh, you know, with younger children in the room tonight that just defiled the temple of God. Wickedness. And Josiah thought, man, we're going to clean this out. We're going to get rid of this garbage. And boy, he began to work and he began to do all that he could. But you know what he didn't have? You know what he didn't have tonight? He didn't have a Bible. Josiah had no truth. There was no book that they could go to. Hey, the land had been so defiled by sin, there was no book, no truth. But boy, what a blessing this is. They start digging around. They start cleaning out all the mess. And in 2 Kings tonight, it's our other reference. In 2 Kings 22 and verse number 28, if you got your place marked, listen to what it says. 22, verse number 8, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 22, 8. And Hilkiah the priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I believe he yelled it, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Man, they're digging around through all that mess, through all those ungodly idols, and all of a sudden he reaches down and says, Hey, boys, I found the book of the law of the Lord. And you know what he did? As soon as he found it, 
He started reading it. Wouldn't that be a good idea? As soon as some of you find your Bibles that you lost a long time ago, it'd be a good idea if you'd read it. Amen goes right there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Some of your Bibles are so spiritual, they've been in church for years. You've got to take it home with you. Read that thing. And you know what? The Bible tells us that they get into that thing. He begins to read it in verse 13 or verse 10 and 11. He tells the king. And he reads it to the king. And when Josiah hears the words of the book of the law, boy, in verse 13, he says, Now go and inquire the Lord for me, for this people and for Judah. He said, For great wrath of the Lord is kindled against us because our fathers. And he said that our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all that was written therein. And boy, when he heard the words of God, it made a difference in his life. You know what you ought to thank God for tonight? The truth of this book right here. Hey, it's not hidden somewhere. It's not lost to you in your society. It's very prevalent today that you've got a copy of the Word of God. It's a blessing. Hey, in early, uh, boy, the, the early 14, 1500s, hey, some of them didn't have a Bible. John Wycliffe put it into English for the very first time. And before that, you know what they did? They took whatever the Catholics told them was right and believed it. But then some of them started getting a Bible in their hand for the very first time, the truth of God. And tonight, some of you got a Bible, and it don't mean as much to you as what it should. Oh, right. Hey, my Bible means a lot to me. I mean, I don't like to go anywhere without it. I don't like to lay stuff on top of it. I can't stand for the pages to be folded. Yes, I do underline with a ruler when I write in it. Amen. You guys, know, well, if I got like five rulers, I'm, for one, because I like symmetrically sound, I like lines to be straight. But, uh, you know, the other thing is, this book is something to me. I ain't gonna let it, I ain't gonna leave it in the windshield, you know, where it melts up and looks like it's been cooked for three years in the car. This is my Bible right here. I, look, I've got a lot, but tonight, this one's mine. This one's the one that means a lot to me. This one's the one I read in the morning, sometimes staying with tears when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to me. This is my book that God gave me. And the truth in it has made a difference in my life. Tonight, hey, it should mean something to you. Your Bible should be personal to you. Teenagers, young people, some of you, you lose your Bibles way too much. But you never lose your iPad or your cell phone or anything like that. God forbid. You know why? Because your mom would kill you. But the other reason, hey, is because this book ought to mean something to you. Yeah. That'll be just as important to you as a device you carry around. Yeah. Amen. Adult, yeah. us too. Yeah. I preach at a church in Ohio every year. Art Martin was the pastor for years. In the last year or so, he recently uh, stepped down and let Brother Andrew Decker become the pastor. I'm going to tell you, that man right there, if there's anything you could yeah. say about a preacher, that oh. man loves the Bible. Amen. You know, there's a verse in Psalms 119 that says, I stand in awe of thy word. If I've ever thought about anybody that matches the description of that passage, it's, it's Brother Art Martin. He loves the book. And you know what I asked him one time? I said, Brother Martin, I said, uh, what books have you read? He said, preacher, had never had time. He said, been too busy reading the Bible my whole life. He reads it for hours a day. You know what I found out? <laughs> I found out that uh, I'm a pretty terrible Christian when it comes to my Bible. You know what? I began to talk to some of his men. He said, Brother Matt, let me just tell you about Brother Martin. They said his goal in his life, and he's older now, up in his 80s. He said his goal in his life, he had some spiritual goals. He wanted to pastor for 40 years, and he did. He said he wanted to read his Bible through 200 times. And said, and he did. He said, Brother Matt, he quit counting at 200. And boy, I, I got convicted by that. And then they said, well, they said, let me tell you something else. He said he set another goal one time to read his Bible for 1,611 days straight. 1,611. He's a big, big King James man. And you know what? He said 1,611 days straight. And he wanted to read 40. Let me get it right. He wanted to read 40 chapters, I believe it was. No, no, 40 pages per day for 1,611 days straight. Now, we started looking at that. And you know what that is? The average for most Bibles are about 1,200 pages. That means this. By the way, he did this. That means in four and a half years, he read his Bible through 53 times in four and a half years. 1,611 days, 40 pages a day. And then they said this. and said, just to put more conviction on it, as if I didn't already want to jump off a cliff. They said, and one time when he read it, he read it through on his knees to just show reverence and awe for God's word. You know what I thought? There's a preacher who loves the book. 
And you know what it made me want to do? It made me want to love my Bible. It made me want to, it made me want to get this book up close to me and read it more. Because you know what? It don't live in me like it should. A lot of times, hey, we pass it off. Or, and you might read it on your app and that's okay. But look, you ought to have a Bible too somewhere. You ought to have a book that means something to you where you can go to a place and look at it. A lot of times, if we're not careful, we're so connected to technology. I ain't giving any of you a hard time tonight, but I'm saying you ought to have a book somewhere too that is your Bible, that you love, that you cherish. This book will make a difference tonight. And it ought to in your life. And if you're not reading it, hey, listen, it's probably the reason for a lot of things not going right. I hate, to tell, I hate to say that. If you're in a bad mood all the time, I'd ask you this, how much Bible you've been getting in you? You say, well, things haven't been going to. How much Bible you've been putting in your life this week? It means something. It meant something. It was precious to Josiah. Let me say this to you. Boy, when he started reading it, the truth that was discovered, you know what it led to? In 2 Chronicles 34, verse 36, it led to repentance. The Bible says... God was talking here. He said, as for the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so say you unto him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Verse 27, because thine heart was tender and thou didst humble thyself before God. When thou heardest the words against this place, at the end of the, the verse it says, I have heard thee also, saith the Lord. You know what happened? When he began to read this book, he began to confess sin in his life he knew shouldn't have been there. You know what happens hey, when you get in the Bible like you should and start reading? You know, what, you know what happens? Sometimes you'll get under conviction about things in your life. I read Proverbs every day, and I'm going to tell you, it, it'll smack you around about your tongue in almost every other chapter and what you say. And if it don't get you there, it'll get you in pride. It will. And you know what? If you read chapters 5 through 7, it'll get you in lust. Hey, it'll target you everywhere. In this book, you know what you'll do? If you read it enough, Josiah had a tender heart, and the Bible says he humbled himself. And you know what? God spared the nation because of his humility. Well, wouldn't it be something if we'd get back to this book like we should and humble ourselves? And thank God there's some people in this nation right now that's doing that. Hey, it shouldn't just be them. It should be some of us tonight that reads this book and we say, Oh God, we got to have your help. And we begin to humble ourselves. And the Lord did a work in the days of Josiah. It led to repentance. Let me say this. It led to removal. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you want to get a, you want to get a good read in sometime. Second, Second Kings 23, that whole chapter, Josiah realized if God was going to be honored, things got to move out the door. And I'm going to tell you, he st hey, this guy didn't play. He's like, well, you know, praise the Lord. We're just going to put on a Christian T-shirt with, with a Jesus fish over this, you know, uh, and hopefully it'll, it'll affect. No, this guy was hardcore. He overhauled the kingdom in a massive way. Listen to this. He removed the idols that were worshipped. In 2 Kings 23, verses 4 and verse 14, the Bible says this. He commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the, the priests under him, that they took the, uh, the things, the vessels that were made for Baal, and they went out and burned them without the fields of Jerusalem. In verse 14, the Bible says that he broke them in pieces, the images, and cut down the groves and filled their place with the bones of men. The Bible says that he removed the idols that were worshipped. You know, last Sunday night, for the sake of just not embarrassing the guy, which you wouldn't know him, and I don't really know him either, but I was preaching in a different church last Sunday night, and I was talking about how that whenever Jacob had these idols, Jacob took all these idols from his family before he went back to Bethel, and he buried all of them under a tree. And I just made this statement. I said, you know, instead of Jacob burying those idols where he could come back and find them later, he should have burned them. He shouldn't have just buried them. He should have completely removed them from his life. And uh, I just made a statement about some things. And uh, somewhere along the way, I hit country music. And because there's a lady years ago that was at one of our kids' camp, and she gave up 26 CDs and wanted to burn them because she thought it wasn't a good thing to listen to. And I still think that's just as good of a plan today as it was back then. Somebody say amen. 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 And you know what? She said, I, I, I need to get rid of this. And so I told that this guy in his upper 60s that goes to this church, older guy walked out to his car after church and then he walked back in and had some CDs in his hand he said here you go preacher he looked at him as country music CDs he said what'd you do well I didn't listen to him God help us <laughs> I give them to my wife she's like I'll take them amen so <laughs> and uh, praise the Lord she sold them we made some money no we didn't do that you know what hey, he took those CDs I thought isn't that something 
First of all, that you heard me say that, and then you're going to go to your car in front of everybody and walk back into the church and in front of everybody standing there and say, hey, these are my garbage CDs I shouldn't be listening to. Would you take these and do something with them? Do you not think he could have burned them himself? Do you not think he could have threw them away? What was that? That was humility on his part. He was trying to say this. I want to be as right with God as I can be. And preacher, here you go. Here's my garbage. Would you get rid of it for me? Which I promptly did. Amen. Hey, and Josiah said this. We got to get rid of these things that are idols in our land. Hey, the Bible tells us this, that he removed the idols that were worshipped. He removed the influences that were wicked. <laughs> you read, uh, for time's sake, I'm not going to. If, if you read 2 Kings chapter 23, check this out, verse 5, he removes the hypocrites. The Bible calls them idolatrous priests. In verse 7, he removes the heathen. I almost used a different word. The Bible says, and they break down the house of the Sodomites, amen, that were by the house of the Lord. He took care of the hypocrites. He got rid of the heathen. Hey, in verse 16 of chapter 23, the Bible says, listen to this. Could you imagine the preacher? Oh, let's just take our preacher. He's pretty passionate, right? And verse 16, and as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar. Yeah. Could you see that? <laughs> Up here at McDowell, you know, Memorial and the cemetery. Boy, you're coming by one night and you're thinking, what is that? In the, I mean, in the graveyard. He's, I mean, somebody's down there just jumping on the shovel. Jump, you thought, what in the world's going on? And got a little, you know, a, a flashlight out there and boy, you pull up and it's a, it's a preacher and he's digging up a casket. Preacher, what are you doing? I'm going to set him on fire. <laughs> Can't stand him. Bless God. I mean, boy, the, get, the, you get the skeleton up out of there, stinking like a dead bones, amen. And the candle, I mean, boy, he just over there, jumping on. Hate you. Hate you. I hate you. Now, some of you, you like to do that to people you hate, amen. You, know, you wait till you die. I'll burn your bones. And uh, that's, that's pretty intense. I mean, you know, there's a part of it that I'm thinking, man, Josiah might have been a little, a little crazy. But uh, you know what it was? That stuff was hidden in the earth. And he said, I'm going to dig up everything that's hid. Any hidden sin, any hidden influences, we're going to burn that. He decided we're going to get rid of everything and get clean. Hey, wouldn't it be great if God would be interested in doing a work here in our church and in this fall, if we just dig into our lives and go to the sepulchers in our heart and just remove every piece of garbage that shouldn't be there. Wouldn't that be good? Hey, wouldn't it be good if you went through maybe and talked with your kids about, hey, what are some things you think, mommy and daddy, what do you think some things we should do different in our household? What are some TV shows we probably shouldn't be watching because they swear every like 10th word, but it ain't that big of a deal. You know, if we really get serious like Josiah did, then cussing on TV would bother us. And listen, the wrong kind of music in our cars would mess with us a little bit. But Josiah said this, we're going to remove these things that are evil influence. But most people are just content to pass by and boy, just live with it. But you know, if you want God to do a real work, you got to get down underneath the ground and dig up those dead bones and get rid of them things too. And that ain't fun preaching and it ain't fun listening, but it's good living and it'll help you. And so the Bible tells us this. That the word of God led to repentance. It led to removal. You know what else it led to? It led to revival. I got to hustle tonight, but in 2 Chronicles 34, verse 33, the Bible says, In all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Thirdly, tonight, and we're just about finished, notice this. Notice the testimony that was dynamic. W will you look at this verse with me tonight? Would you look at 2 Kings 23? I want you to look at this, verse number 25. We're just about done. 2 Kings 23 and verse number 25, the Bible says this, And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might. According to the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like unto him. You know what? The heart that Josiah had for the Lord was unlike any king before him. Can, can I say this about Josiah? His testimony was dynamic. And you say, why, preacher? Because I'm going to tell you this. He was real. Hey, look right up here. It's because he was real. You know, there's a lot of people that come to church. And I'm going to tell you what they do. They put on the dog. The preacher talked about that this morning about putting on. But you know what God wants? God wants to look in your heart and see somebody that's real. And you know what I want to be tonight? I want to be real. Not just up here. 
Hey, you forget that. Hey, uh, up, up here, uh, anybody can put on a show, but hey, when I'm down there, when I'm in the privacy of my home and nobody else is around me, you know what I want to be? I want to be a real Christian. Josiah had a dynamic testimony, and it's because he turned to the Lord with all of his heart, his mind, his soul, and his strength. How are you tonight, Christian? Hey, do you come to church? Do you smile and look good for everybody? Or are you real in your heart? I want to be tonight. I do not want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be one that puts on a facade that I got everything figured out. Josiah was real, teenagers. You ought to want to be that. You ought to want to be real for God. And let that mean something to you. He was real. Hey, Josiah was rare. The, The Passover hadn't been kept in years. And when he went to meet the requirements of it, he kept the greatest Passover that's ever been held in the Old Testament. The Bible says nothing that's ever done since then was compared to the Passover that Josiah held. You know what it was? He sacrificed and he gave to God like nobody else ever had before. His his passion, listen, his sacrifice for God was a rare thing because he wasn't content to do it like everybody else was. Hey, he's willing to go above and beyond what was required. Man, I hope I'm not losing you tonight. I hope I'm encouraging you, listen, to be like this. I want to be this in my life. I want to be a Josiah that hey, will not just be content to sit back and cross my legs and think, well, you know, the world's going to hell, so it ain't going to matter if I listen to a little bit of country music or keep, you know, hold on to my sin. No, it does matter. Amen. And if you would decide in your life, you'll be real. Hey, and you could get more clean than what you are. You say, we're already pretty clean. I promise you this. If you ask the Holy Spirit you might could get more clean. Because there may, hey, you may have took down the high places, but there may be some things in the sepulcher of your heart that God wants to work with even a little bit further. How about it tonight? Hey, his testimony was dynamic. Brother Brandon and uh, Carter, would, would, would you fellas come on up here and help me? Tonight, let me give you the last thought. Number four tonight, let me say this to you. I want you to see the tragedy that was devastating. I want you to look one last time with me in your Bible in 2 Chronicles chapter 35. Look with me, please. 2 Chronicles 35 and verse number 20. If y'all don't care, you can just sit right here in these two seats, brothers. Thank you. (laughs) 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 20. Brother Ken, as I was reading this story, here's what really jumped out to me. You know what I thought about? Hey, listen here. I thought about the trend that was different. Brother Jason, I thought, wow, Josiah, and I know you probably preached about Josiah before, but I thought, wow, this guy was unbelievable. I mean, he went against the grain of everything in the culture. He went against what everybody thought he should do, and he was different. Hey, the truth was discovered in his time because of his cleansing the temple and cleansing the house, and God brought about truth, and he brought about revival, and he had an unbelievable testimony. But you know how the story ends? There's tonight, look at me, there's the tragedy It's devastating in Josiah's life. And it's this verse that just kept haunting me as I read it. The Bible says this in chapter 35, verse 20. And after all this, you know, I thought in my office today, Josiah, after all the blessings that God gave you, after all the victories, after all the joy, after all the purification, after everything God had done in your life, the Bible says when Josiah had prepared the temple, that Necho the king came uh, of Egypt came out to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates and Josiah went out against him. And notice what the Bible says. But he sent ambassadors to him saying, he, said, he basically was saying this, what are you doing, Josiah? This has nothing to do with you. Mind your own business. And I'm telling you this because God told me to tell you. And the Bible says in verse 22, nevertheless, Josiah would not turn from him. You know what happens? After all the victory... That God brought into Josiah's life. Brother Brandon, come here. Just sit right up here if you would, please. We're going to let him picture Josiah for just a minute. After all the blessings that God had given him. Hey, look, can I say it like this? We're talking tonight about from victory to vacancy. Because there's one day when he is eight years old, Brother Vaughn, God gave Josiah a seat. God said, hey, Josiah, I'm going to tell you something, boy. That right there is your chair. I'm going to let you be king of Judah. Hey, Josiah, this is my will for your life. Is that place right there. And you know what? God gave him a place to sit. God gave him a seat to occupy. 
But you know what? There come a day in Josiah's life when he became distracted with something that was not in God's plan for his life. He started leaning out of that seat a little bit and looking at something that was going on that really had no business and didn't pertain to him. And after a while, before he knew it, Josiah had left that seat, left that place where God said, Joe, this is for you, man. This is where I want you to serve. And he leaves that place, the Bible says, and he begins to pursue something that God had no intention for him to pursue. And if you look at verse 22, the Bible says this, that he disguised himself. Josiah pretended to be something that he was not. And you look at him and you think, what are you doing, man? And God cautioned him and God did all these things and here he is. He's the king of all of Judah, one of the greatest ones. And you know what he does? With Brandon? He leaves that seat. You know what? Just go sit over there. And he goes to fulfill his own purpose. And not long after that, you know what happens? The arrows of God's judgment penetrate his life. And he's wounded and he dies in that state. And after all this, well, you know, in your Bible, you ought to underline that after all this, after all this. Hey, in your life, after all this, are you telling me that you can walk away from the place that God's given you after all this? Hey, look at your wife and think about that. After all this, could I go and find another place to sit? Look at your kids tonight and ask yourself the question, after all this, could I really go and do something else? Look at your church tonight, hey, and after all that God's given you, could you really walk away? Is something else really that important to get you so distracted that you get mixed up in it and in a matter of a heartbeat, Josiah's dead. And they're dragging his body out of that chariot and you know what happened? Can I say this to you tonight? The tragedy was because, it was a tragedy because of the immediate implication, and that was this. The spiritual, I'm almost done, Brother Cole. Will you go to the piano? Was because of the spiritual momentum in Judah was dead. Yeah. It's dead. <laughs> By the way, tonight you could do that to this church. You could do that to your family. You could. Hey, tonight, but Brother Charlie's a good man. We're good friends in the ministry, and the, the kids love him. But you know what? Tonight, if he decides I'm going to leave my chair, then he could destroy the spiritual momentum in our kids. Hey, in my own life tonight, I could go looking around, Brother Jody, and after all this, are you kidding me? After all that God has given me, I could walk out of my chair tonight and think, well, boy, that looks like it's fun. And the Holy Spirit says, don't you do it. Don't you, you get back in your seat. Don't you do it. And boy, I begin to ignore the, the warnings and the wooing of the Holy Ghost and I can destroy the spiritual momentum. But here's what's really sad. Is that the tragedy was because of not only the immediate implication but because of the future devastation. In 2 Kings 23 verse 30, the servants carried him in a chariot dead. And you know what the very, first th the very next thing says? And the people of the land took Jehoahaz and made him king. Come here, Carter. Come here. Come right up here. Let me help you. Sit right there. Sit back in that chair. Jehoahaz. You know what he just seen? He's a cute kid, isn't he? Oh, Jehoahaz. You know what he had just watched? He had just watched his daddy get killed. Dad just, he had just watched him bring his body in. Hey, it is, could you picture this? As it's pulling him out of the chariot, taking off all of his royal garb, there's that crown laying there. And somebody looked up there and thought, well, somebody's got to fill the seat. They said, here you go, boy, you're next in line. Took that crown, put it on his head, and they said, you're king, good luck. Let me say something to you. Say something to you about his son's beginning. You know what he saw? He saw a daddy that turned away from God and died that way. And then he started looking and think, I have to fill this gap now? Hey, he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready for that seat. It wasn't his yet. But you know what? Because daddy decided to go and chase the king of Egypt, something that he should have never done. Jehoahaz had to look around and say, I ain't ready to wear this crown. I'm not big enough to fill this gap yet. And he began in a place in life that he never should have had to start at. 
because of a daddy that wouldn't do right, because of somebody in his life that he looked up to that would not stay where God put him. Then we see his behavior. And the very next verse says this, and Jehoahaz did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Three months is all he made it. Three months out of 31 years, his daddy was in that chair. And three months is all Jehoahaz could do because his behavior was against God. And then you know what you find out? <laughs> this is interesting. I just thought about this. I didn't even have it in my notes. But you know, the very same king that got Josiah, got Jehoahaz. We see number three, his son's bondage. They come and wrap Josiah up and they took him in captivity to Egypt. And the very same thing that killed his daddy killed his boy. And you know what happened? He watched, hey, he watched his daddy follow something that he never should have. And Jehoahaz thought, you know what? If it ain't good enough for daddy, then I'm gonna live the way I wanna live. And he died in the bondage of his own life. And can I, I wonder this tonight. I wonder what if the throne had never been vacant? What if Josiah had stayed and fulfilled the seat? What might his son have been? After all this, I wonder what God could have done. Tonight, can I say something to you? You have an assigned seat God give you in life. Hey, you've got one tonight that God gave you. You may, you may not like where it is. It may not be comfortable. Brother Thomas, we may look and say, God, I would like to upgrade today. And God says, no, you can't do that. This is your seat that I gave you. you got to sit here. And sometimes the turbulence is bad in that seat. You don't like it. But it's where God puts you. Let me ask you tonight. Hey, where are you supposed to be? Are you where you're supposed to be tonight in this life? Because I'm going to tell you something. Somebody's watching. Miss Kay's been faithful for all these years. And there's been a lot of girls that's watched her. My daughter loves you, by the way. And you know something? If she jumps out of her chair before time, it might kill some of the little kids. It might break their heart. Let me ask you tonight. Hey, where's your seat at? Or do you even care tonight? Some people wonder in Egypt, they could care less what anybody else thinks. I'm going to tell you what, somebody's watching your life. And it may destroy somebody else if you're not faithful to where you're supposed to be. Brandon's a good man. God's done a lot of work in his life. He got, he got a testimony, man, of the grace of God. And I know just from being his buddy, you know what? I know, I know what he wants to do. He wants to stay in his seat. He wants little Carter to grow up one day and fulfill God's plan for his life. But if daddy can't keep his seat, there's a good chance the same devil that got daddy's the same devil that'll get his boy one day. Let me ask you tonight, where are you at? Hey, you've been wandering out of your chair? Has the Holy Spirit said lately, come on down here, buddy. You can go back and see your daddy. Has the Holy Spirit said lately, hey, you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be looking at that. Hey, I'm going to tell you tonight, God's got a plan. You can go ahead and be seated, brother, if you want to, for your life tonight. And by the grace of God, I don't want my life to be the story of from victory to vacancy. If somebody comes around and looks and says, hey, who used to be here? Well, that was so-and-so that came to New Manor. How about it tonight? Hey, where's your seat at? Are you in it? You say, I hate my seat. Well, I'm going to tell you what. God put you there on purpose. It's yours tonight. You ought to be faithful to it. Amen. Hey, and I'm going to tell you this one day, if you will, God will give you an opportunity to pass it on to somebody else but tonight I wonder have you wondered from where God wants you to be I want to finish my life well I want to finish my course well I do how about you tonight I wonder has the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart in some way in your life could you look in your life tonight in the sepulcher of your heart and say there's some things that I need to get more clean in if God's really going to do a work in my life in my family in this church and we need to get cleaner than what we are at our house how about it tonight? I wonder, would you bow your head and stand to your feet tonight? Brother Cole's going to sing, if the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart, would you find a place tonight on this altar? Would you come tonight and say, God, I don't ever want to vacate the place where you put me. It's important. It's precious tonight. God has given some of you some wonderful things. And boy, what God would, would never say, after all this, I'd walk away from what God has given to me tonight. I wonder, would you come? Would you ask the Lord to work in you tonight? And if he didn't speak to you tonight, you ought to come and ask him, why not?
Let him work in you. Brother Cole, would you sing a little bit tonight, brother? Would you mind the Lord?